Hi, welcome to the Company of Dads Christmas Wrap Up. We made 47 original podcasts in our first year and it's been fantastic. I like them all, but for any wrap up, you've got to pick some that stand out. We're going to listen to highlights from five lead dads. Mike McGee, husband of famous golfer Annika Sorenstam, Tony Maws, award-winning Boston chef, J.R. Havlin, Emmy award-winning comedy writer, Tina Ritchie, my childhood best friend and a longtime Home Depot employee, and Max Rivera, a New York City firefighter. What they all have in common is their lead dads, just like me. First up, Mike McGee, husband of Annika Sorenstam, one of the greatest golfers of all time. Mike could not have been a nicer guy, and he had an insight into what it's like to be a lead dad to an elite athlete. How did it all start? Listen to him talk about it here. You said that from him and your mom, you you, you sort of learned a lot of lessons, and, and you said it really prepared you for you know what you've you know been able to do with, with Annika and your kids, and really be there. You know, still have a career, but really be supportive. Was there ever you know did you have a discussion when you and Annika got together and, and you were going to start your family as to how things would be uh, divided up, or or was it something that happened? It did, just just happened. No, uh, we we did not really. It just kind of organically happened. But I did have a discussion with my mom uh, when I started seeing her and truly turned the corner in our relationship. I I didn't even want my dad to know because it's such a small world, the golf world. I knew he bragged to his friends, and then it would get back to to her like, "Oh, we're dating, huh?" Um, I mean, it's here she is. You ask, how do you ask the number one player in the world out? That was the height of her fame. That was after. Yeah shooting 59, Colonial, um, getting inducted to the Hall of Fame, went in 13 times, 12 times, 11 times. And, and so, it, but it, it was easy for me because we knew a lot of the same people. Um, we, we ran in you know, the similar circles with golf, but my mom, I, I, I mentioned to her this and she said, that's great, honey. You know, she seems like a wonderful person. Um, and, and she knew that I was in it for the right but, reason. But, but you said, don't, don't tell dad. Is that it? Whatever yeah, you do, yeah, don't tell dad. Cause he was yeah. going to call now, like Ray Floyd or Andy North and, and blow this for me. Exactly. I said, for now, don't, don't say, <laughs> um, and she said, I just want you to remember one thing and you'll be fine. And I said, what's that? She said, every relationship has a King and every relationship has a queen. Sometimes the King's the queen. Sometimes the queen's the King. And, um, and that is so true. Such valuable advice. I know She's the, the dominant one in our relationship. She's the, the breadwinner. She's um, strong and, and I support her in every way I can. And I'm proud of that and I love it. And I'm happy being a stay at home dad when she's got to go to, to Asia for trips or sponsor outings or our foundation events or anything. Um, I, I do whatever we can do. You know, the, the trips that I used to go and schmooze and network and, and try to do more deals, um, a lot of times now I'm staying home with the kids because I know it gives her peace of mind. So I just kind of do whatever she wants, really. Um, but I mean, she's great. She's respectful. We work hard. We work together. I mentioned we share an office and we're back and forth all day long, whether it's our foundation. We have seven global events for junior girls. Um, spend a lot of time on that stuff. She goes to every every one of the events. I don't get to go to all of them. Um, but then we just started this sparkling classic cocktail called Fizzy D's. Right. Um, sweetened with organic honey, these um, Cosmo, Margarita, Moscow, Mule Mojito. And that's been like my third full-time job recently. So we are none of, none of those sound, none of those sound like popular drinks in Sweden. If you ask me, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Like, yeah, they're popular everywhere. <laughs> you got to get the transfusion. You got to get the classic golf cocktail in there. Exactly. So that'll be part of line two. Once we get there. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think any lead dad can identify with what you just said and the way your mom put it is, is, is really true. But I think for a lot of guys, it can be, you know, difficult, you know, money and masculinity are, are intertwined. Um, you know, you, you, you are married to, you know, the greatest female golfer of all time, but I mean, you know, some of your buddies, you know, who used to you know, travel around with, I mean, did they ever, you know, give you any crap about this or is oh, it just, a, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. And I laid down the law immediately. Um, they would call me, Mike Sorenstam or Mr. Sorenstam, I said, listen, we don't use the word Sorenstam and anything we do. The entire brand is built around the one word Annika, which she became, you know, in the mid 2000s. So everything is Annika. Please call me Mr. Annika. <laughs> but I, I do have a funny story, though. We were at uh, this Callaway Invitational that used to be at Pebble Beach um, in the, probably the 
the late 2000s. And, and my dear friend, Andy Bush, who um, is married to Morgan Pressel and runs Outlier, um, a golf company management, that, management company that has a bunch of tournaments on the LPGA Tour and handles some corporate stuff. And, and we, he said, I'm buying you a drink. I said, I'm buying you a drink. Come on. I mean, we grew up working together at Executive Sports. So for three years, we worked together, you know, went our separate ways. And now we're both married to, to LPGA players. And so um, I was used to the crap. He was used to the crap, but we hadn't really talked about it together. And we were at this little bar at Spanish Bay, you know, right? And he said, I'm buying. And so I said, fine, okay. So he, he wins the check and the lady says, what room number? And he says, you know, 212 or whatever. And she says, thank you, Mr. Pressel, and hands him the... <laughs> we both cracked up because it, we, we loved it. You know, it's, we're proud of it, but it, it just made me laugh to see somebody else deal with it. Up next, you got Tony Maws, an award-winning chef, famous in Boston for his daring dishes and fantastic cocktails. Craig Yamain was a staple of the Boston dining scene. During the pandemic, Tony strained to keep his three restaurants afloat, but that work caused him to rethink what he was doing. He decided to make some radical changes and become a lean dad while his son was still in high school and to be there to support his wife, who had been soldiering on through the pandemic as a teacher. I caught up with him as he was just adjusting to his new life and venturing into a new career that will put being a lead dad first. This is probably the first time that you've really been able to reflect, like to reflect back on you know, yeah. 20 years as a chef owner, 30 years as a chef, because before it was just like, okay, head down, got to do this. I'm going to create something new. I'm going to, you know, try a new restaurant. And, and so you're- well, and, it's, and it's gone through an evolution. I mean, all that reflecting. There was the early days where I was freaking out. And then there was the, you know, walk, I told you about this walk I had with my son. Um, we were on vacation and this is just, you know, a little while after we, we had closed without, before I had made the formal decision to actually be done done. And my, my son, Charlie looked at me and he's like, dad, this is so awesome to have you here. You're not on your phone. You're not at your computer. You're not placing orders. You're not talking to sous chefs. You're actually here with us. This is awesome. And I started to cry. Um, and he, he looked at me and he, because he's such a great kid, he's like, no, 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 not like those other times were so bad, <laughs> you know, but this is just really awesome. And I went back and I looked at Carolyn, my wife, and I was like, I, I think I just made up my mind. Like, I think I'm done. Like, yeah. just whatever, you know? So I had to get through that part of the reflection before I could then actually think about the next. And it took a lot longer. I mean, you read about burnout and you know, and morning and things like that. And, and you think that you can just muscle through it because like I said earlier, in terms of the pandemic, put your helmet on, you'll just plow right through. Yeah. But your brain, your brain's a complicated thing. And, and it didn't want me to, I would sit down to try to write, you know, the story. Like some people wanted me to write the story or, or the resume or, or reach out to people. And I literally couldn't, I couldn't get there. I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around it yet. It wasn't ready. And it was only two months ago you know, I closed in August and it was just like two months ago that I actually began thinking, okay, here we go. Let's, let's figure out what this next is. Let's start having the conversations. Let's, you know, because it's also really, it's really humbling. It's scary. Like I have to admit, not just now to myself, but when I'm doing this, I'm admitting to other people that this is a different Tony than what they had known before. And I might not be good at it. I'm not coming, I'm coming with whatever expertise I had. But now I'm talking to you about something completely different. And yeah. that's, holy crap, that's, that's scary. I love that story about you and your son, you know, walking on the beach and the moment, you know, I have three daughters, but my favorite thing to do is not to take all three of them out at once because that's actually a horrible thing to do because then they start to fight. <laughs> that's actually no fun at all. But it's those moments I get with just one because – I, I know that something's going to be said. Something there's going to be an interesting conversation. There's going to be a sort of a deepening of our relationship, but I don't know when it's going to happen. You know, is this? It's not like you know, with being a lead dad, with being a parent, you can't just say, "Okay, hey, I got this time. Uh, it's uh, seven thirty on a Tuesday night. Uh, let's sit down and, and talk." You know, it doesn't come out that way. It's 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 moments like that. It's that walk on the beach you know, with your son or, you know, it's, I, I love taking my daughters around to different things with their friends because they turn the radio off, you know, you hear sure. all this stuff, but you only get that by being able to, to be there. Um, well, also, well, exactly. So it's being there. So now I've had a ton of those conversations and they're not, they don't need to be in such a 
profound place. They can be on the way to hockey practice. They can be on the way, like I, but I didn't have those moments before I was in the restaurant, you know, yeah. and I would, I would convince myself that I was being, you know, present that I, that I was that guy. And I would like almost force myself into conversation sometimes or something like that, but they didn't happen naturally. And now like he and I will go for a walk and like go to a coffee shop or we've had, you know, go to a taco joint together or have fun. And, but it's us, it's us being us and talking about something or nothing. Sometimes it's deep and meaningful. And sometimes it's about the Red Sox, but it doesn't matter. The point is that I'm, I'm actually present in those conversations physically and mentally. There were times before where I'd be sitting at the breakfast table and I'd basically, be, you know, be so tired and so overworked and so stressed out. And I'd be like drooling on myself. And I'd be like, I hate to say it, but I'd almost be like faking it to him and to my wife, like that I was present. And sometimes my wife would call me on it. You know, she's like, you're not here. You know, you're not here. And it never, I, I mean, it's my own, it's my own thing. I, I don't regret any of the things that I've been able to do. Um, Cause I've, I've been very fortunate, but. I had to get beaten over the head with a pandemic to actually realize what I thought was important, what I what I really believe in, and how I how strongly I feel about being there for my family. J.R. Havlin won eight Emmy Awards writing for The Daily Show when John Stewart was the host, which might make him the funniest lead dad we talked to this year. But he takes being a lead dad to his son and daughter seriously. Well, I mean, he leaves them play it for laughs. He talked about how he and his wife, who runs a school food program, decided he would become the lead dad. He also answers the question, did being a comedy writer equip him to handle parenting better? You know, your kids are getting older and, and you, you and your wife have this discussion about, you know, what are you going to do? Like, you know, are you going to hire a caregiver? Is one of you going to pull back? Is one of you going to become the primary parent? How did that conversation go and, and how did you become the one who either was selected or, or put his hand up to be be the lead dad in your house? Well, that conversation was earlier when I left the, the Daily Show because we, you know, I mean, we talked about it like a year before I left and then, and uh, um, you know, and, and then more seriously, like uh, um, uh, I made kind of a drama out of it. I, I left the, the, the same, I made, I announced that I was leaving the show the same day, 18 to the year, 18 years to the day after I started, stuff like that. Right. And, um, and then I was gone later that month. And, um, but it was, uh, you know, a, a year before I was like, oh man, you know, this is, this is not it's becoming kind of a drag. And then, and then a half a year after that, then we, she and I had this conversation um, and we are, the kids were very young, uh, you know, they were four and two or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said, I just don't want to be there. And, and she said, she just said, okay said, then don't. And so I left and then what I didn't anticipate, like I didn't really want to work anywhere for a while. I'd been, I was kind of burned out on top of that. So I was only off for a month or two before somebody offered me a job, you know, helping him develop a show. And I was like, yeah, of course, sure. I'd, I'd love to. So I go do that. You do that for a few months and then somebody, uh, and then I'm off for a couple of months. Somebody offered me another job and I wasn't really looking for stuff, but it kept getting offered up. And they were different writing gigs uh, um, and and usually developing shows and for different amounts of time. And uh, some lasted more than others. Mm -hmm. And then that just kind of kept going that way without any of them really taking grip, which was too bad. A couple of them were good projects that would have been nice. Um, and then uh, And then honestly, it just sort of dried up a little bit and I didn't really think about it. And then I just kind of became somebody who was at home doing you know, only stuff that I wanted to do and yep. it's working. So we were like, all right. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be, I'll probably be looking for work in one form or another um, soon enough, more, far more actively than I have been because the kids at this point now are starting to be able to kind of take care of themselves a little bit, you know? Yep. Yep. Uh, but when, you know, you really embrace this when they're quite young, uh, kids are uh, notoriously taxing. They, they rob us of sleep. Did being a comedy writer equip you, you think, better than other parents to handle the sort of, you know, absurdities of of young kids and in, in parenting? Has it given you any anything it, it you would share with any my, tips? It, it would have if my dumb kids knew any popular references. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, what am I supposed to do when they don't understand the joke? You can't, you can't explain, I can't explain joke. everything not, to them. No, it's not funny when you explain the joke. No, no they got to get out there and live a little, you know? <laughs> Read a paper every once in a while if you want to understand daddy. I can't, can't walk you through this. <laughs> Come on, you, you, there aren't any tips. There aren't any. Were you able to lighten it up at all and, and see the sort of was there any tips for non funny lead dads out there that you could you could share? Well, again, yeah, don't 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 try to be too funny. Your kids don't really think you're funny. <laughs> My kids often don't think I'm funny either. I, I feel like uh, um, you know, if uh, if dollars were eye rolls, I'd be way richer. <laughs> I'd be so I'd be filthy rich right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's most dads know like how to have fun with their kids. It's just about being present. It's being in the moment. It's, it's showing interest in the things that in the things that they do and and listening to the songs that you hate that they like um, and uh, letting them play them in the car and and messing around with them and just kind of being there and and trying not to yell, you know, I'm, I'm no, I'm no model parent, you know, I've had yeah. plenty of, plenty of issues, but, uh, um, uh, but you, you, you get better at it. And, you know, I, I'm just sort of naturally goofy and playful, I think for sure. So that, that, uh, that makes it a little easier, but like yeah. I said, you know, the, the kids don't always want to do that. You know, <laughs> they're not always the best audience. Sometimes they're like, if it was between them and a bunch of surly drunks at a, at a late night open mic, I, you know, I might, I might take off and go to the open mic. <laughs> Tina, Richie and I have known each other since we were kids, like when we were a couple months old and being baptized kids. By age 10, we were hanging out at camp and playing golf, we went to high school together, visited each other in college, slept on each other's couches after school, helped each other move stuff into and around our first homes, went to each other's weddings, and were there when our first children arrived. He now lives outside of Fort Worth, Texas. When I told him about the company of dads and the concept of lead dads, he said, that's me. Well, we've been friends our entire life. We talk about how hard it can be for lead dads to make friends with other dads or some of the moms who are out there at school as well. Have a listen. One of the more difficult parts about being a lead dad is to find, you know, friends, is to find other guys who are in a similar situation to you. So, you know, when you're in Western Massachusetts, you just had, you know, I was a lead dad, but still sort of undercover. But, you know, you had all the rest of us from high school and we'd pop in and the people you grew up with. What's it been like since the move to to Burleson, you know, outside of Fort Worth? What's it been like there, you know? I joke, you know, the loneliest person on a playground is is the dad in the playground sure, full of moms. So yeah. what's what's that move been like, you know, coming from Massachusetts and, and going to, to Texas? As well? uh, you, you've hit it right on the head. I mean, you know, loneliest person on the playground. Um, you know, today, prime example. So I'm off today, obviously, doing this with you. But if I wasn't doing this with you, I would be in my house by myself doing some laundry, uh, you know, maybe depending on the weather sometime in the next hour or so I might sneak off and play 18 holes of golf by myself because I don't know anybody else in this situation. You know, um, most of the friend friends that I've met, you know, fathers of friends of my children, they're, they're nine to fivers, you know, or what used to be considered nine to fivers, but they work Monday through Friday. They have their weekends. I don't have that. I have Monday, Tuesday is my weekend. So, um, you know, and, and like you said too, is you know, you go to these these functions as the as the dad with your children, and there may be one or two other dads in the entire room of whatever the function may be. It's all moms because, <clears throat> as you and and Professor Shockley were talking about this in the last podcast, there's still that sort of design that moms do all of this stuff. You know, dad goes to work and does that, and mom takes care of the kids, and that's just how it's going to be because that's the way it's always been but for you and I it's a little different because we go to work and we take care of the kids or you know from my from my point for a long time I was and you know I told everybody this I was a part-time employee full-time dad you know I was Mr. Mom and I, I was okay with that I loved it um you know a lot of that comes from you know growing up my father was work 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 and I'll get to the family when I get to the family you know, he wasn't 
at all my baseball games as a kid. And he wasn't at any games as a kid because he was always working. Um, so, you know, early on when I became a dad, I said, you know, that's not going to be me. I'm going to be involved in as much as I possibly can be involved in. Um, and that early experience with my son with not being able to be involved in stuff, just, it really got to me. It hit home. It just, it hurt me that I couldn't be there. So I changed it and I was happy to change it because honestly, it's, I get more out of seeing them doing their stuff, whatever it may be, um, than, you know, putting my nose to the grindstone for 80 hours a week. Cause like I said, you know, my dream was not to become, you know, the greatest flooring associate in the history of Home Depot. Hey, I like what I do. I love my job most days. Some days aren't so great, but that's true for any job, right? Um, but, you know, my kids and my family are definitely where my priorities lie. And, you know, if it, if, if it came to one or the other, kids and family are going to win out every time. And I don't, think I've, I don't think I've ever tried to hide that from anybody, including Home Depot. I've made it pretty clear that, you know, family comes first for me. Yeah. I mean, you and I, we grew up, uh, you know, always cracking jokes and, and I often wonder if that's kind of an armor that lets us be, you know, lead dads. Cause I mean, quite frankly, we don't give a shit. Like if we went into a room and it's all moms and nobody's talking to us, well, we're there for our kids. And if somebody yeah. talks to us, great. Um, but I, I, I were, I don't know if every lead dad is, is like that. I mean, when you think of the times that you've been able to, to break through, uh, in that group and just be a parent not be, you know, a dad amongst moms, not to be, just be a parent and, and to be there for good reason. Like you want to make a play date for your son. You want to make a play date for your daughter. You want to, you know, your daughter's a big softball player. Now you got to be able to coordinate the, the different, games. what, what's been the key for you to, you know, have those, you know, breakthrough moments where, you know, the moms just accept you as a, as a, as another parent, just like they are. I think it just comes from the fact that, that being there over and over again, the moms start to recognize that, okay, he's, he's taking the role. He's taking the lead on this. You know, he's the one that we're going to deal with because he's the one setting up the play dates. He's the one going to the open houses. He's the one, you know, whatever, um, you know, and I, and I think that's where it kind of, you know, it really is more of acceptance from the other side where, you know, the moms just kind of go, Oh, okay. That's why he's on the playground. You know, not like, you know, oh, what's this guy doing over there on the playground? You know, it's they finally realized that this is what I do. You know, I'm, I'm taking my kids around and we're going to the playground and we're making play dates. And but, you know, I'm the guy. Max Rivera always wanted to be a firefighter from age four on. A lot of kids feel that way. But Max fulfilled his dream and now works for the New York City Fire Department, known as the bravest. He's also the lead dad to a young son and a young daughter. His wife works in finance and has less flexibility, so he is happy to embrace the role of being a lead dad. What do Max and I talk about? Well, how he, as a firefighter, might have a leg up over the rest of us dads when it comes to parenting. All right, I gotta ask you, start off here. What's harder to respond to? Uh, a three alarm fire or kids <laughs> screaming in the middle of the night? Oh man. Um... You know what? There's a lot of overlap there because there are oftentimes kids screaming in the middle of the night at three alarm fires. But when they are your own children, uh, I, I'd have to say that's harder. It's always um, there's a lot of overlap in the job, but there's there's something very specific when it's your own child. And it's never easy. You never know exactly what you're doing. Whereas at a fire, we have SOPs. There's always opportunities to deviate. But the reality is we pull up to a building we see what we see, we make a decision, and we go forward with the plan. Your child's screaming, you open the door to his room, and who knows what you're going to find. <laughs> <laughs> that mystery continues to stop me every single time it happens. I remember, so I've got, I've got three kids, three daughters, 12, 9, and 4. And when my wife was pregnant with our first daughter, we went to the, the local hospital in Sanford, uh, Connecticut, and we did one of those parenting classes. And you sit there and it's, you know, six o'clock at night, they got some donuts, you got a, a, yeah. a cup of coffee, and somebody's teaching you how to swaddle a baby. And you're like, this, this, this shit's easy. I, I got this. And then yeah. when you actually have a child and it's the middle of the night, and this, I was like, you know what? This class would be better done, like in the middle <laughs> of the night, after you've had like four beers, uh, you've got a full bladder and somebody's yelling at you. So that's why I think yeah. you have a leg up on the rest of us yeah. as a firefighter. You, you were, you've trained for crises. You trained under pressure. 
And so when you open that door, you're like, you just got to react to what you see. You're like, okay. Yeah. A lot of guys I work with talk about that. The overnights actually being slightly easier for us as dads, um, given our, our profession than it is for the moms. But you know what? They're, they're feeding. Uh, they have a completely different job assignment than what we have. Oftentimes, it's just wake up, go console the baby, maybe hold the baby, maybe feed the baby if the baby's being bottle fed. But uh, certainly, like I said, there's overlap. It, there's something unique to being a fireman and uh, waking up overnight and having to kind of immediately go to work. Thanks for listening. I also want to give a shout out to two others. Marvin Aviles is two part podcast on battling to get custody of his daughter. It's an absolutely remarkable story of determination. And Andrew Jensen, a popular YouTube golfer who opened up about his struggles with depression and suicide. It's a fantastic story about how he's turned things around and his focus on his son. Please give them all a listen and enjoy your holidays. Thanks for being part of the Company of Dads community. <laughs>